Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Ask Dave. This is a very, very good question. It's one that may seem to you kind of simplistic, but it's not when you really think about it. Here's the question. A viewer asks, can bad engineering in the recording studio irredeemably mess up an otherwise good performance? And is the conductor present to supervise the mixing? I'm assuming this is an orchestral recording. I'm thinking of how sections of the orchestra can be highlighted in a way that doesn't sound at all like what you might hear in the concert hall. Well, the short answer, actually, and this may surprise you, you might think, well, obviously, if the, you know, the engineering sucks, it's going to mess everything up. The answer is no, it can't. And the answer is somewhat built into the question. Can it irredeemably mess up an otherwise good performance? Well, what's an otherwise good performance? If you know it's a good performance, then it hasn't been messed up by the engineering, has it? I mean, it really hasn't. You may, you may hate the way it sounds, but somehow you still understand that it's a good performance. I mean, question answered, right? Well, Maybe it's not quite as simple as that, but let's let's dig a little bit deeper and then we'll address the other issues in the question. First of all, first of all, as I already suggested, classical music performances are quite hardy. The question becomes, in the case of an orchestral recording, but we can broaden this to any other kind of recording as well, whether it's vocal or, or you know operatic or solo piano or whatever it is. How much musical information do you require in order to determine if a performance is good or not? The evidence seems to be, based on my own experience, very little. Um, it, it's kind of interesting when you think about it, because let's forget for a moment we're dealing with an issue of ideal sonics in, under studio conditions versus horrible sonics under studio conditions. People listen to all kinds of recordings made under all kinds of conditions. And I'm particularly thinking of, first of all, historical recordings, which are awful <laughs> by, by modern standards. You know, 78s, things like that. People listen to them all the time. Fort Wengler recordings that sound like hell. And people scream about how they're the greatest recordings ever. His Nazi, you know, performance of Beethoven's Ninth is one of, you know, the most abysmal performances of that work ever from an engineering standpoint. And I would argue from a performance standpoint, but that's another question. But no one seems to have any problem acclaiming it the best ever. I mean, we listen to the Lisbon Traviata. It's unlistenable. I, someone just wrote the other day about uh, Kirsten Flagstad and Fort Fengler doing the four last songs on Testament. Unlistenable horrendous. But this person was talking about, oh, the, the voice is like burnished gold. Arguably, the tessitura was too high for her at that point. But this person doesn't hear that. And you can't hear the orchestra. And there's, there's static all over the place. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's grotesque. But it doesn't stop some people from thinking it's just fabulous. Now, there will always be those outliers, those people who say, well, the sound doesn't matter to me and I hear everything and it's fabulous and wonderful, terrific. Okay, that is true. But it, uh, oh, there are, it will also be the majority opinion. And the majority opinion will be that that recording is unlistenable. And I go by the majority for these things. I really do because I think that, I really don't think that it's, 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 it's a subjective issue at all. I think that the people who love bad sounding recordings are largely delusional, <laughs> especially when it comes to historical recordings or someone who sat in an opera house with a microphone up their sleeve and a little tape machine in their pocket and recorded a performance. And all you hear is, you know, <laughs> there's no, there's no accounting for that, but there is a type of listener. And we've talked about this before who imaginatively recreates what cannot be heard and attributes it to the performers, even though it cannot be heard and objectively, factually is not there. And they still come to the conclusion that it's a great, fabulous, terrific performance. So that's, that's one extreme, let's put it that way. But uh, this question is a little different from that. We're talking about studio conditions 
in which the sonics are poor and and or 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 different and here we have to be very 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 specific a studio recording is not a concert recording and the objective of making a studio recording is not to duplicate a concert experience um it really isn't because it can't so it's it's, it's pointless to try um it's only a question of how satisfying the musical experience is all by itself in its own right let me give you another an, uh, another example of this. I, I when I moved into my new place here, um, I, I hired a guy who does sound systems um, to help me with my with my equipment because the actual house came with a surround system in the living room that I had nothing to do with, and and I had to get my I needed a new amp and I needed we needed things fixed up, so 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 he helped me get all my equipment together. And I was playing some samples of music for him. And one of the things I selected was the Pines of Rome. And I chose two recordings. There was the Reiner, the classic Reiner recording, which was engineered by, who was it, Louis Layton and, you know, all the, fa the famous RCA living stereo people. And, and the Biss recording with John Neschling and the Sao Paulo Symphony, which, you know, Biss makes wonderful records. Robert Suff, who was their engineer, was amazing. And, you know, they, they did really, really great work. And this was a, one is a recording that was patently made for, I mean, remember studio recordings of orchestral recordings are not studio. Usually they're not in a studio, they're in a concert hall. So it's a concert hall recording. I mean, this was made in, in Orchestra Hall in Chicago. And, but it was obviously multi-miked, obviously made to give, you know, ultimate clarity. Whereas the BIS recording, which was a new digital recording, was made to reproduce the sound of the orchestra in the hall. And the RCA was immeasurably clearer than the BIS in terms of what you heard. The BIS had this enormous amplitude and dynamic range, um, particularly, you know, at, at the climaxes that the RCA didn't quite capture, but the RCA didn't lose anything because, because of all the detail that came through. And because it's a fabulous recording by any standard anyway. I mean, it's really, really great. But those were two different recording philosophies. And you can't say that one of them ruined a recording and the other one that ruined the performance or made it less good than the other did. I don't know if the recording the Neschling performance in the, in the RCA style would have made it sound better or worse. They were both very good, but very, very different. And frankly, neither of them reproduced what you hear in a concert hall. They didn't. They're all different in that sense. And in, in an even larger sense, we have issues with concert halls. You might as well talk about, forget recording, the acoustics of the room. I mean, we have terrible concert halls that we suffer through. Albert Hall is like, you know, an aircraft carrier, the Rudolphinum in Prague, which is also reverberant like crazy, or, or, or the Barbican, which is dry as dust. So is the Academy, of Music, the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. It's why the Philadelphia Orchestra developed that voluptuous sound to make up for the dryness of the old Academy of Music. Uh, Avery Fisher Hall, when it was Avery Fisher Hall, now it's Geffen Hall, but I mean, it was a disaster from the day it opened. And it went through various remakes and remodelings to try and mitigate its, 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 its horribleness. I mean, so, so there's that aspect too that we have to deal with. There's, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect environment and certain works sound better in certain acoustic environments, certain works benefit from certain approaches to recording. So when you, when you, when you put that all together, um, you're left with a, a, a certain level of subjectivity, but a remarkable consensus, I think, that Great recordings sound like great recordings. We, great performances are great performances, whether or not they're well engineered. In order for a, 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 the engineering to absolutely destroy a great performance, it would have to be of a level of incompetence and amateurishness that you just don't find in the professional world of record making. You find it in the amateur world of record making, or the people with the microphones up their sleeves at the opera house, that you may find. But in, in real life, very, very seldom. Um, so to move on, 
So I think I've answered the second part of the question, the idea that sections of the orchestra can be highlighted in a way that doesn't sound at all what you might hear in a concert hall. It never sounds like what you might hear in a concert hall. And like I said, you shouldn't even try. It's a different and equally valid experience. Remember, there were some artists like Glenn Gould who gave up concertizing entirely and who, who, who lived in a completely artificial soundboard. Stokowski loved tinkering, you know, with the sound. If you look at his notes, you know, he, he sends, you know, he would listen to a test pressing of something or a test or a tape, an initial tape, and he would send notes to the producers saying, bring up the oboes here, take out that, do this here. You, you use electronic recording technology hopefully um, to the advantage of the music and thus the performance. Sometimes the artist's version of what the advantage of the music is may not be yours, but it's, it's, it's valid. And if enough people you know, agree that it's a wonderful performance, then it is, whatever the engineering is. Um, is the conductor present to supervise the mixing? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Some conductors care about what the recordings sound like, some don't. It's a really interesting phenomenon, frankly. I mean, if you listen, I remember listening to, to you know, those box sets, you know, the big boxes, and we could tell that there were some conductors who just didn't care what the recording sounded like. Ricardo Muti doesn't care, <laughs> clearly doesn't care, doesn't pay any attention. Some conductors really did. Stokowski paid tremendous attention. He was a chord guy. He cared about sound. He really cared about sound. Um, but, uh, you know, Sinopoli cared about sound, interestingly. Some, some people really paid attention to what their records sounded like and made sure that they, they achieved a certain level of sonic fidelity but others were not so interested in the recording process. And so they left it up to the engineers to, to do the best they could. And then that was that. I mean, Klemper really cared about the sound of his orchestra and how it was captured by the microphones. I, 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 it all depends. There are no rules. There are no rules whatsoever when it comes to these things, but there is definitely, um, I think it is definitely a fact that you can listen to a performance independently of its engineering and separate the two um, in your listening experience and be frustrated and be frustrated. Someone wrote uh, just, just today or the other day about Beethoven piano sonatas and said, well, you know, okay, Igor Lev, it's really good, but I hate the sound. It's as if you're in the back of the hall and I can't stand it. I need more tangibility in my sound room. Okay. That doesn't mean it's a bad performance. It means you hate the sound. And, and some people love the sound. Others, you know, Igor Levitt probably loved the sound. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the quality of the performance in general, as I'm saying, um, and I'll stop repeating myself now, comes through in a professional recording setting. Whether or not everyone agrees that it's good recording or bad recording or good sound or bad sound, you can really, you can usually tell. Um, and that is a separate issue from those poor deluded souls who are making things up because the sound is so bad that you can't hear anything. And they're adding the things in their brains that are not available um, on the actual, in the actual sonic medium that has been preserved. We have to set that aside in order to have a sensible discussion about this. So I hope that answers your question. Take heart. You may hate the engineering, but you'll hear the performance. I'm sure of that. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.